I've almost quit on this project for like a lot of times, you know, because it wasn't my comfort zone, right? I had to learn a lot of stuff. I had to fail a lot. So I was in the flow cytometry at MIT, the Cook Institute, and it's like, this is it. Like, you know, it's like Michael Jordan, you know, uh, making a shot. Uh, 10 seconds of the time. The, the full cytometry happened, like the populations are right. And we went to sequencing, that's like the final, that's the final check. And if like any errors in the sequencing, because we didn't really like, we were not thinking of oh, error correction back in the day. Like, so any error on that base if, in the sequence, there, if there's any sequence, we won't get the picture of Lincoln. Like we would have, mm-hmm. like, and so I saw the picture of Lincoln, I'm like, and I told him, like, uh, are you sure this is correct? <laughs> uh, I couldn't believe it. Like, yeah, we just pulled out Lincoln. That was the beginning of, like, let's, let's just finish this. And I think we, we got something. Welcome to Tough Tech Today with Mayan and Miller. This is the premier show featuring trailblazers who are building technologies today to solve tomorrow's toughest challenges. I am Jay Mill uh, of Tough Tech Today with with mine and Miller. I run a research and venture company, um, and and so work very closely with Airbus Ventures um, on on sort of te- assessing the new technologies, frontier tech that's coming down the down the pipeline, and seeing how that what the world is going to be, and what kind of um, what kind of teams are really building building that future. And so from autonomous systems to space and other forms of like sort of satellite systems and propulsion um, and and everywhere in between. I'm Forrest Mayan, the other co-host. Just two seconds on my background. I'm a senior member of the technical staff at Draper Labs in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I'm also part of our basically space systems engineering group and i also do our startup outreach i'm a program manager with our similar startup outreach office yeah i'm james manal i'm a postdoc um, in the department of biological engineering at mit professor mark potter's lab um i work on like the wackiest things in 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 in, um, computing and storage right now which is on quantum computing and on dna data storage so those are the two things i'm you know, fascinated by right now, what keeps me busy, what keeps me awake. DNA storage is certainly in a really interesting area because of it's, it's unconventional computing, it's unconventional storage. Um, and so, you know, looking at this is, this is a couple of years, several years, decade, maybe in terms of the future that, that you're building James, but you've got the front row seat on this. Like you're, you're the, you're the maker of this. So I think it would be helpful to understand, like paint a picture of what this world could look like as you're, uh, of what you're working on right now. It's pretty exciting area. Um, so actually just, just way of stepping back a little bit, it's like how I was introducing DNA, DNA data storage was like, I came in 2016 at MIT and basically my PI told me, um, you're going to work on this and you're going to work on DNA data storage. And, um, I remember I had the Trello board where I put DNA, DNA data storage as like my back burner um, because it's like, it's too wacky. I don't know if there's anything useful there. I, don't, I didn't believe it. And then, um, you know, I did a little, a little bit of reading, following up on, on a lot of the papers. And then and what I, I realized is that the, um, what, it, what the data dense is just so immense that you can literally replace a Facebook data center that it occupies, you know, a huge massive area uh, somewhere in, 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 in Oregon <clears throat> into the size of a, a sugar cube, for example. All that data squeezed into the size of a, a sugar cube. And so that, that really fascinated me because, you know, the, uh, those data centers, um, you know, they, it, most of them is just uh, a- empty space. And you, if you can, and there's like energy, constri- energy uses, you know, I came from a solar cell background. So for me, energy is uh, something I, I, I care about. And so like when I heard of DNA data storage, and what it can do, like it's a passive um, data storage facility, I got super interested into uh, uh, building that. And so what I imagine the future would be is like, you can put you know, all the data that you have on Facebook uh, and you know, just put it on your, like basically, I don't know, in your pocket, um, you know, petabytes of data. Uh, basically you don't have to delete anything again, right? So that, that's, that's the promise of data storage. 
uh, and and you know the I don't know if you guys watch the 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 show um, Silicon Valley. Uh, I was a big fan of that show, uh, and then one of the episodes there, um, they were talking about compression and like data get in, and like you know there was this white paper from the International Data Center uh, that that predicts we're gonna run out of silicon uh, by like 2025, which is like <laughs> pretty close already, uh, uh, and that we're gonna have silicon to store all the data in the world. Um, so we need to uh, start looking into uh, alternative data storage um, approaches. So that that to me, uh, that to me spoke that that show spoke to me about you know like data get in like I can, I don't want to have a future where there, we're gonna have data rations and and, and that. And so uh, yeah, for me the future would be like you know everyone democratize everyone has their like from DNA everyone will have their own data center in their pocket. So that that to me is. Uh, worth uh, worth investing my time and energy on. It's it's super dense storage of data, but are, are there challenges with like read and write speed? Like, how how do you actually read the data off DNA? Yeah, so right now the way to do it is you basically write. The way to write data first uh, is to um, we use a very old chemistry, and it's very old it's from like the maybe in the seventies or eighties uh, chemistry, and then miniaturizing that instead of like flask, miniaturizing that into droplets, uh, in microarrays really, uh, and you start writing that uh, one letter at a time, um, but there's a limit to how much length of data you can write, so that you can like multiple um, strands of DNA. Uh, and you, you write it simultaneously um, up to 200 base pairs. Um, and beyond that, you sort of like have diminishing returns on the, um, um, the amount of, 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 of um, DNA you get. Still a very slow process, right? So, you know. Uh, like how slow? If I want to save a 10 megapixel photo. Or- yeah. So, I mean, uh, so there, there's, there's a lot of different approaches. Um, one, one approach that um, right now I think... The, the numbers I, I, I've seen is like 1,000 terabits a day of, of writing um, is, 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 is now feasible. Um, so that's like something from catalog DNA. Um, they, they, uh, they were doing that printing DNA at, at like 1,000 terabits a day, which is, you know, compared to modern uh, CPU uh, computing or, or uh, computing architectures, it's, it's really not, uh, you know, not yet comparable. But, you know, it, we're still the early age stages, so I, 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 I'm, I'm hesitant to say that you know it, it won't be faster. It, it won't get fast. It won't. It, it won't necessarily be faster because you know, you know, you can't be faster than electrons at some point. Um, but but you know, chemistry will. Uh, chemistry and you know, very hard engineering like miniaturizing the volumes significantly to squeeze a lot of more unique DNA into tiny tiny spaces would be the the next thing to go. Um, parallelization. Uh, so it's really, really slow. So 1,000 terabits a day is, I think, what's feasible right now. Now, the upside to that, though, I mean, despite the slow read speed, or yeah. sorry, the, write, the slow write speed, is that DNA storage has the, um, I'll say that the, the evidence shows that it, it could stay in a, as, as, a, as a storage medium for measured in decades, right? Like half a century or so with with not as much energy input as you would need to with say the magnetic disks that we would commonly use or perhaps even like comparable to, to tape perhaps right yeah so that's that's the promise of dna data storage is really it for archival like it's, it's still probably first in class to archival storage right um you know i don't know if you guys watch uh, jurassic park but like that's like an analogy uh, i usually use to people who don't, who don't um like want to have a grasp of like like how long dna can last like you know like it's you can you can get dna out of fossils uh so that's how long dna uh can last so that like that's one of the like biggest advantage of dna is really the longevity that's that's the upside of like um of that as a storage um, platform so yeah definitely the archival um you know there, there there there's not a lot of the storage um approaches right now can even come close to how long DNA data, like how long story data can be stored on, on DNA. So that's, that's basically a different category of DNA uh, of storage, of data storage. Where do you store the DNA? Like, is it in like a 
big vat of like DNA fluid or is it <laughs> like laid out on like a silicon wafer? Like, what does that even look like? Yeah, so so that that's a, that's a good question. Um, so there's a lot of different flavors. Um, so the the answer to that question is we have to go start with how do you first access the data because that actually okay. um, that's actually how you gonna figure out how you're gonna store them in a very different way. So right now the most uh, the common way to access data using DNA storage is using polymerase chain reaction or PCR. Uh, what basically is, you basically have a homing molecule that targets a specific, you know, ID on specific data you want to target. It, that ID could be the metadata of that, of that, uh, of that data that you want to access, and then you basically do a, a, a polymerase uh, chain reaction. You you amplify that target many many times, and and then you put it in the sequencer. Um, and so that process of like that molecule homing into the, that, 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 the, the thing that you want to access uh, is, you know, based on the Watson Crick based pairing, basically, um, you know, the, the ATCG sort of base pairing um, uh, that, that we all know from, from um, you know, high school biology, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that process is, you know, there's a certain limit to like how uh, the specificity of that and like in a large vat of like, you can imagine a large vat of DNA and you put that homing, like there will be some words that will be partially like, you know, sticking together, you know, even though they're not perfectly complementary. In, in other words, they're like the, the base pairing is not always perfect, but there will be some partial uh, interactions and actually actually goes uh, go makes your uh, retrieval system out of whack. So there's the the number of molecules you can put in in that vat is limited because of that. So so one way to, to like some some folks like the like the Microsoft research team who has really pioneered a lot of this um, in the, the area uh, is to use uh, droplets of DNA with like you know, a certain amount of data and barcoding in there and then separating them into really this tiny, tiny droplets and then merging okay. them. Yeah. So it's like microfluidics approaches. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah. And the other way we were doing it right now is differently. So in our lab, we did it differently. Um, so what if we really just limit the, the you know, the, the, the interaction of the target molecule and the the homing molecule to just the the metadata itself, like the internal data is limited. So there, therefore, the number of the probability of finding like you know partial interactions becomes lower because of that. And that's 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 our sort of like innovation recently in the lab that um, you know we've, we've we've been pushing forward. And so that's and so that and, and so what it looks like now all of a sudden instead of like large number of tiny tiny pools, you can have very small, tiny pools, because there's a limit still, um, you know, that um, how many unique data you can have in that tiny pool. So, so that's how it will look like in the future. It's like, it's basically a wet computer. It's not going to be a dry computer, that's for sure. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, I almost picture like, a, like a, a, an aquarium sort of thing or full of the sea monkeys or like an ant colony, like a, almost like a zoo. But yeah. I, I, I guess it's more like, a, you know, it's not quite as, as animated as, as that. <laughs> Is it E. coli ultimately, or it's it's even more fundamental than? Uh, like in terms of writing, uh, of like what's the what's the DNA you want to write on? Um, so yeah, yeah. yeah, it's highly customized. So it's not it's not definitely it, like so the way the like the Microsoft team has done, and I'm just gonna talk about them because they're really the pioneers on this. Um, they what they did was highly customized sequences that you know, like I was telling earlier about microarrays, literally a silicon wafer with you know tiny tiny strands of DNA poking out, and then synthesizing that through microarray synthesis. And so it's highly customized. It's not you know doesn't encode uh, specifically for an organism. Um, the way we did it is we use um, the bacterial machinery um, just because we want to make the beauty of DNA data storage. Also, it's not just the archivals because you can make millions and billions of copies of that by taking okay. advantage of the bacterial machinery, right? Yeah. So if you want to like, you know, share share some music really fast and rip a bunch of CDs, you could use a, a DNA method to make just billions of <laughs> DNA CDs really quick. Yeah, like for example, like if I go to say, if I'm the, the Large Hadron Collider, like, um, you know, like they, they have like 
you know, serious, you know, probably a, a close to exabytes of data right, right now from the those experiments. Like, I want to make copies of this, like hundreds of copies of this. Try doing that in a, on, on today's technology. I don't know. I, I can't even like imagine the, the difficulty of doing that. But with 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 um, you know, with with with, with biology, thinking about that, it's like makes millions of copies like it's nobody's mm-hmm. business uh, with very low energy like trying to do that with current technology it's going to take a lot huh. of energy yeah oh, awesome the, the pirate bay of dna I didn't exactly <laughs> wow. uh, well what james what's driving you to to work on on this because this is this is awesome oh it's because it's super hard like there's a lot of uh like like you know I think it's like the common theme theme in MIT is like you do very hard problems and that is like the solutions are not very obvious. And so like mm-hmm. it's just super hard. Like um it's not like you need a Nobel Prize winning idea to, to, to solve the problem. No, it's not necessarily that. It's just the it's a very hard engineering problem right now, I think, for DNA data storage to get to into the market. It's really just figuring out how do we miniaturizing thing? How do we miniaturize things? How do we make reaction volumes tiny enough that you know we're not using a lot of reagents and stuff like that? And so there's nothing Nobel Prize winning about that. We just, but it's just really hard engineering, and that's well, you know that's uh, that's what keeps me interested in the area and what keeps wants me to keep pushing, um, getting this out into the market. I think there's there's a lot of potential here. Um, it's just you know really hard engineering. Yeah. <laughs> So, so you mentioned pushing to get it out in the market. So yeah. you're trying to form this or you've already formed this into a venture and you're pursuing commercialization of this technology? Yeah, we're, we're, we're definitely thinking about that, uh, you know, making a venture out of it. Um, you know, the I think the, the next step for data the story is just not just, you know, you, you've talked about earlier about reading and writing. You know, there, there are players that are working on that. But, but really, I, I think it's, it, it needs to be in a point where we start build, thinking about a full stack approach mm-hmm. where you have not only the reading and writing, but the access, the random access, right? Like, if, if it's just reading and writing, uh, that's going to be bad because, you know, if, even if you can write an exabyte of data, if you need to find a kilobyte of data out of an exabyte by reading the entire exabyte of data, that's going to be super bad and wasteful. So you need to be able to uh, somehow random access um, some of those. And uh, building uh, sort of like that uh, interface to me is an interesting problem. The other interesting thing that um, that needs like needs to be worked out, like I think that's why we're thinking about the venture, is like how will I actually how will a customer like yourself would interface with it? Will it be the same like as the Amazon web server? Will it be something like, you know, like how Dropbox is? And it, like, you know, so those are the things that that I think is worth, well, you know, it's not going to be interesting from a lab, from a lab, you know, academic lab, but will be interesting for a venture uh, like like what we're planning to, to launch on. Yep. When you came to, to MIT in 2016, uh, it sounded like this, some the, the, the early stages of this project was, was sort of like, okay, James, you're going to work on this. How, how is it different than what your application and your, like your statement or your research statement was? Uh, yeah, it sort of evolved really. Um, uh, so, you know, when you're going to work, when, when I was given this project, um, it, it was, it was definitely, um, out of my comfort zone and, and because I came from solar photovoltaics and, uh, but, but, um, you know, I'm always willing to do like, go out of my, out of my way and try to figure out something new. Um, but, but it's sort of like, um, the, the, the funniest thing is that I started to like learn about computer science a little bit, started to learn about a little bit synthetic, about synthetic biology. I uh, had really good um, uh, lab mates who were like very patient with me uh, on this project who worked with me and, and you know, were basically my co-authors in the paper who, who, who guided me in, in, into this, uh, you know, journey that we are so far. And, and, and basically I was an organic chemist and a physical chemist who like, was always like looking at lasers and you know shooting stuff on a on a on the glass that has some colored stuff on it to like someone who's like now messing with biology and trying to integrate it with with uh, with with, with uh, some some new materials that we that we thought we could be useful for. So it sort of definitely evolved like from the research statement of um of of like yeah I'm just gonna solve this problem to like let's try to solve the entire uh, full stack problem of DNA data storage. 
What what does ten year old you think about it? Ten year old James. <laughs> Uh, uh, definitely. I think 10 year old James would say, that, yeah, you're crazy. <laughs> Why would you do something that, you know, you, you know, I, I always been in the, um, physics chemistry side of things and like, I'm going into the biology now and like, like you're crazy. <laughs> Why would you attempt that? But it, it's been a fun journey. It's been a good. When you were 10, you were in the, the physics and chemistry side of things. I, I'm that de- I was definitely, my parents were in, um, were in the government, the science government uh, in okay. the Philippines. Uh, they were working. Uh, my, my dad was a, it's funny enough, my dad was a zoologist and my mom was a microbiologist. So I hated, they always bring me into their lab and <laughs> and I didn't <laughs> like doing it. And then, but there was a- And now you're going in on the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> like my mom would ask me to count the number of cells on, uh, oh, sorry, number of like, uh, yeah, the colonies on, on a, a Petri dish or something like, uh, something like that. Uh, uh, for free <laughs> but then there was a chemistry lab upstairs in, in their in their office that I would go up to and then like uh, and then I would there was a physicist who, um, in there um, who was a volcanologist really who I would talk to about and yeah I was I was definitely from you know, like always fascinated by physics and chemistry and biology is like eh. like my dad would have like would show me how to kill a rat for like the like uh, medical medical um, stuff so it was definitely <laughs> I think my friends would be very proud that I've I've, I've come to the to the, to the dark side <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what a childhood <laughs> <laughs> yeah wait so when, when would you say what how old were you when you first started counting cells uh, I would say I was um, seven years old I remember and the reason oh, why wow. I remember this vividly because um, that's when I started to be really fascinated by science. My my dad gave, gave me this World Almanac for Kids, 1997, um, mm-hmm. and there's like so many like things about science in there. And then my 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 aunt gave me this book about space, about dinosaurs, and that's like yeah, that's that's where my science journey began. It's like uh, like I got fascinated by space actually. Um, so that's that's basically how I got into like science early on, but. But definitely not like in a two-year-old, like some of those uh, prodigious people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That sounds pretty early uh, <laughs> to be working in a bio lab. I know I wasn't doing that when I was seven. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hated like, you know, like when you count. Um, so we I remember, and I hope my mom doesn't listen to this. Because <laughs> um, um, she, she would ask me to count like colonies. And there's like this code, like uh, too many to read. TM, uh, TMTR that you would put if it's like more than like if it's just so hard to count and I would always put mm-hmm. TMTR <laughs> to both of them because it's so so boring and like I can't believe we're doing this still uh, I think it's like, automated and I wish I learned about um, machine learning back in the day I, can, I think I can automate that <laughs> that's but anyway I was a kid uh, so that's, that's what it is that was cheap labor Exactly. <laughs> That's what kids are for. Your own kids. <laughs> I have a two-year-old, so I'm going to start putting them to work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just, there, with, you, you said that this is like, um, it's, this is such a challenge. Like this is, this is a big, big problem area with so many unknowns. And it, is there something that when, when you feel like it's, you know, this is like, yeah, this is hard. I kind of, feel like quitting have you felt have you a felt like you know what maybe there's something else i should be working on besides this big problem and then secondly since you're, you're still working on it what what helps bring you back to the back to the lab to do this yeah. hard stuff yeah i mean yeah for sure um I, I think you know like i've almost quit on this project for like a lot of times you know because it wasn't my comfort zone right i had to learn a lot of stuff i had to fail a lot um so that that like because, because it's not on my area so i didn't know the tools i didn't know like oh you shouldn't do this like you know for example if you have very long dna you shouldn't like pipe it very rigorously it will just just break up so i didn't know that and like my pcr were failing and 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 and, and basically like all my experiments were failing so definitely there was a lot of um I, I there was a point where i think 2018 i went to my pi's office 
um, basically I told him like, you know, I've tried everything that I can, you know, I don't think I'm, I'm up for it. And then I gave him slides of all my progress and, and I asked him like, maybe we can contact this professor who would be like probably more as better people to do it. And then, and then it wasn't, the, it was a sort of Friday afternoon. And then, and then he said, yeah, well, I'll, let's, let's mull it over on the weekend and I'll send, send me those slides. And then, you know, let's go back, uh, you know, let's meet up on Monday again um, to see if I should send it or not. And then the weekend came and then Monday came and then we, we had a meeting again and basically, basically said, uh, no, you can do it. I know you can. <laughs> so I feel like he basically told me to like do the project again. And you know, I, I gave him a lot of credit for like really believing in me, even though I was not the right person for the task and like failing, I failed a lot for two years. I had, um, negative data until like I got my first positive data uh, 2019 uh, around July when uh, he went to Croatia and I was like um, this is my last chance you know like Michael Jordan fourth quarter uh, 40 seconds on the clock uh, you know I, I need to make something uh, like I've learned so much on so many failures and I have to figure out something and so I just kept pushing and you know like for me they, you know if I, if I gave up 2000, in 2018, if like I listened to myself, my PI I just said, "Yeah, yeah, you know, you're not capable of it." Um, you know, it would have been a different story. But you know, I, it's all credit to him for like believing in me and um, you know, trusting that uh, I, would, I would, I would, I would try my best to like figure it out. So, yeah, I mean, for like um, th those challenging years of, of failures, uh, after failures, two years, uh, or, or uh, two years or three years. Um, what came me forced me to come back in the lab you know even now right coming back in the lab is it's just you know sometimes you just try a new idea like you know like there's this there's this quote from like you know there's there's ten thousand ways i think from thomas edison there are ten thousand ways to fail you only need one way to make it work and and so you know that 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 rest that that is like sort of the thing that always in my mind uh back of my mind is a very important Thing that a scientist or anyone entrepreneur or, or whatever uh that you need to have it's like you will face ten thousand fail that's not ten thousand ways to fail but you know you just need one way to make it work uh, and so you know it, if there was like a very good story behind where we are right now that will be a, like a lot of failures until we found that uh, magic ma magic sauce that that made it work yeah so explain how you felt when you saw that positive data <laughs> And oh. like, what, what were you doing? Like, what, what is it? What does the positive data even look like? Yeah. So I was in the flow cytometry in MIT, the Cook Institute. And it's like, this is it. Like, you know, it's like Michael Jordan, you know, uh, making a shot uh, 10 seconds at a time. And then the, the, the signal on the flow cytometer, uh, you know, the, the, the data points came in and I was like, huh. <laughs> It's exactly what it should be. Like I, well, my first reaction was I was skeptic. If there's one, if there's one skeptic of my work, I'm like probably the biggest skeptic of my work. Uh, I don't know if like my people who work with me probably doesn't know that, but like I would spend hours and hours trying to convince myself this is true. You know, I'm 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 always a skeptic when something like goes work. Like if you've, if you've been if you've been failing for two years. And something works. I'm like, you, 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 you start to be skeptic. This is like unusual. This that that's like that becomes the like the unusual thing. <laughs> it's not supposed to work. Not supposed to work. So yeah, I spent. I look at the data uh, and then repeat it again, repeat it again until like, okay, I need to show this to my PI when he comes back from Croatia, and and, and basically. Yeah, I was like hoping someone would tell me you're an idiot, you're 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 biased, but yeah, everyone said like, wow, it actually works. <laughs> so, so you know that that became the uh, that, that that was a sigh of relief that until like someone said, ah, wow, it actually worked. You know, um, yeah, I'm I'm the biggest pessimist of my own work and the biggest critic of my own work. You know? Were you trying to save like a particular message, like hello world? No, no, we're actually, we're, what, what we were doing back then was to get out uh, the picture of, um, what do you call this? A picture of uh, Abraham, Abraham Lincoln from a pool of data. And, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I was trying to build like the Google search engine, like 
Like I would, I would. Right. Put so you key. pull it up and it's just a picture of Abraham Lincoln and that's how you knew it was real. Yeah, we, and you're like, we, eh, we actually it. doesn't look like Lincoln. It looks like Washington. <laughs> no, I don't know if this no. data is right. <laughs> oh yeah. Like it was like, I remember like seeing that data, uh, like, so, so the, the, the full cytometry happened, like the populations are right. And then we went to sequencing. That's like the final, that's the final like, check. And if like any errors in the sequencing, because we didn't really like, we were not thinking of oh, error correction back in the day. Like, so if any error on that base if, in the sequence, there if there's any sequence, we won't get the picture of Lincoln. Like, we would have. Mm -hmm. like, uh, and so I saw the picture of Lincoln. I'm like, and I told him, like, uh, are you sure this is correct? Because <laughs> uh, I couldn't believe it. And, like. Yeah, we just pulled out Lincoln, and it, it wasn't like we we're like pulling the name Lincoln out of the pool. We were doing like how would you do it in Google, like uh, like president and um, eighteen uh, and not eighteenth century, for example, because we had Washington also in that pool of uh, image. We wanted to pull out uh, mm -hmm. Abraham using a Boolean search query, and we got out Lincoln, and and, and basically that, that 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 was it. That was the that was the beginning of like let let's just finish this, and I think we we got something. Uh, so that that was a. Uh, Interesting time. So 2019 is definitely up there. You know, <laughs> uh, 2020 is definitely just <laughs> not going so well. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that that's that's basically uh, the, that feeling was was definitely uh, something that um, I, I really liked. You, you mentioned like you were able to use Boolean operators on this data and yeah. get yeah. a search result. Um, that, that you expected to, or not, that you did not expect to, but you were hoping for deep down. So then is one of the next phases somewhere on the pipeline to be able to, to apply the machine learning algorithms on top of this, this presumably like large massive data that you have stored? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, that's the beauty of DNA as well is, you know, one thing that, that, that people should remember is that DNA is all our molecules and like all other molecules, they do reactions in 3D volume. And that's a very huge interaction space. Like, um, and so you can basically think of DNA, and this is like the, the whole concept of DNA um, computing back in the day started as like this, this massive degree of parallelization. Almost like you can think about it as like you have an Avogadro's number, um, six, to the, six, six times to the 23rd number of CPUs that you can use uh, to do some computation. And, you know, I don't think any computer right now can, uh, that has that amount of CPU power. Uh, and so that's, um, that's like the, 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 the next big thing is like, how can we use this platform? We can now Boolean logic, cool. Um, but then I think the next step would be like, can we apply some, some of those uh, machine learning uh, um, operations and stuff like that um, for um, data storage where it becomes not only just a static storage, now it becomes a computing platform. And uh, there's, there's, again, this is coming from the Microsoft group that they recently uh, put, in a, put in a preprint wherein they were able to do um, uh, machine learning on a data set of data images. So basically how a gig, um, they, they, basically, they basically show like, uh, how would you, uh, how an image Google search engine would work on a DNA data storage system. Uh, and so like you will have like, for example, when you just look for a black, uh, search term, black cat, you'll have an uh, array of different uh, results that you'll get from Google images. And basically they, they were showing uh, a similar operation on a DNA data system. And so that, that is a interesting direction for the field. And I think that's gonna be an important asset for DNA data storage as we move forward. I mean, the like with all these capabilities, who knows what 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 it what what the future could be. So when you're when you're building up your company and trying to spin this out into a venture, who's I mean, who's gonna buy this? Who's your first customer? Who's the person that really needs a solution and you know is is ready to, you know, give you give you some money to store and multiply massive amounts of data. Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, so assuming, you know, we solve DNA, right? We solve DNA read costs and like everything's becomes, you know, hunky dory. Sure. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to start with that assumption. I would say, you know, the biggest ones would be um, those who would have uh, large amounts of archival data, like Facebook okay. or, or Twitter. Um, you know, I, I think most data, most social media companies, they are, they're, they're the biggest culprits why we were like get, heading in towards, 
um, this data again. And if like we're producing a lot of data than we uh, right now, right? So social media, you know, I just learned about TikTok because of coronavirus. Because TikTok, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like my, I was like, oh my God, there's like so many videos. I'm like, and, and they're all, sure. I'm, not, I'm not even going to go to the argument. Like people are just copying other people's dances. You know, I'm not going to even start in that discussion. But like, <laughs> oh, well, well, we'll make it, we'll make a tough tech today TikTok. So. <laughs> Before we let you go, we'll do one of the dances. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, James, you mentioned, you mentioned a term, um, is it data get him? Yeah. What 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 is it? Walk our audience through what that could be. Yeah, it's actually like a coin a word I uh, I got from a show from Silicon Valley, the show Silicon Valley from HBO. It's uh it's basically to a point where you know we're running out of data that uh, that we can use. Uh, so we're running out of storage we can use to store data. And that scenario could be to like like the HBO shows. But it, it's a parody of, of of Silicon Valley, really. But it's like it's, it's an idea that I has like um, that actually resonated with me. It's like when to when we get to a point where the amount of data we've generated is uh, is like reaching to the capacity of what's possible right now with with silicon based storage. Like, do we start rationing data? Do we do we start like um, you know rationing data for every person in the world? You, know, you can only use uh, 500 megabytes. Uh, for your uh, for this day, then you so you're different. telling me that the like the internet's about to fill up, or like, like what's the situation? Like, how do we actually run out of data storage? Can right. we just so, make more hard drives, or are we going to um, run out of materials to make them? Yeah, I mean, I mean, like most of the hot data we use right now, they're they're you know they're in, they're we delete them, right? So some of them gets deleted and, you know, we don't really care. But there are some data we that, that we generate where we don't want to delete them. And they're occupying, um, you know, some, some you know, basically some in, in the silicon. Uh, and so the how are we going to run out of, of data is because the, the, that data, the, the amount of data that we're, we're not deleting is increasing. And so we need, and we, we, we're getting to a point, we're going to go to a point where, there's not a lot of silicon left in the world to to make uh, um, this this uh, hard drives, um, and so that's oh, that's wow. yeah. So that's that's the scary scenario. That's the worst case scenario for uh, this. <laughs> um, you know, like compression can only do so much, right? Like uh -huh. uh, some people would argue, you know, there's there's a lot of ways. You know, Dropbox has has some very interesting um, compression algorithms, but compression can only get you to uh, so far. And so from the hard drive. Uh, sorry, hard. Uh, sorry, the um, hardware hardware uh, side of things. You start thinking about uh, how much silicon do we have in the world to actually accommodate all this data. And you, if you, someone did the math uh, in the paper in Nature Materials, uh, you know we, we we're gonna run out of silicons uh, very very soon um, for two like years, so. like years, decades. Uh, if you, if you believe in the um, twenty twenty five um, report, like. In, in 10 years or five to 10 years, that, that's where it claim. But um, uh, I, I'm assuming like, you know, I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon, you know, maybe like there will be some, um, some other platform technologies to start to come in and say, you know, let's let's sort of have a band-aid solution to this while, you know, the other techno other um, storage technologies. So maybe I, I would I would be conservative and say it's gonna be like in, in, a, in, in decades, maybe 20 years or something like that. Sure. Um, yeah. But uh, in the long run, that means there's tremendous demand for technologies like yours or even your technology. Yeah, that, that's, that's for sure. Because uh, that, that, you know, the, the amount of data we generate, generate is not going to stop anytime. So it's not. Oh, no. Yeah. Go down. <laughs> is uh, it exponential? I, it feels like it's exponential, at least on my hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think so. I think it's, it's especially uh, with all these podcast videos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, yeah. from uh, 1080p to 4K to 8K. Then yeah, yeah, 8K. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, like just the movie industry itself, right? Yeah, it's they're moving to like 4K now, um, Blu-ray to 4K to 8K uh, quality. Um, so it's kind of just go up, keep going up and up, uh, and it would start like you know, there's with apps, social media apps, um, you know. For, for videos like Quibi, for example, I've never heard of it. Someone told me, a friend told me about it. And like, there's some, there's, there's another like TikTok like sort of um, app. So you know, just mm -hmm. social media is gonna keep growing. I don't think it's gonna stop. <laughs> uh, 
so so definitely we're heading towards that path and how long will it take it depends on like what kind of band solutions we have until like we figure out alternative technologies to um, store data uh, in, in a much more um, sustainable uh, way scalable and sustainable way my understanding is that in terms of uh, that DNA storage would be one of the mediums that would help us in sort of a this through this data get in the sort of post silicon storage era right. um, and so DNA that um, aside from support systems cooling or what other, whatever is needed, that DNA itself could store the amount of the data generated globally for an entire year, could store that in approximately a, a one meter cube, right? Is that, right. Is that consistent with, with some of your findings? One, me, one meter cube, that's pretty big. Like today, like generated today? Yeah, yeah, a cubic meter of, yeah. say, I don't know, like modified D, E. coli or whatever. To, to store that much data. Yeah, yeah it's more, probably close to that. Yeah, um, it depends on like, um, yeah, I, I, I say it's something close to that. And then the reason why I'm like hesitating is because it's like, are we talking about dry DNA or wet DNA? Uh, so, but yeah, so, so yeah. So, uh, We're I, talking I, fingernails, James. How many fingernails? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so yeah, I think like, you know, I think the one year cube is a fair, fair number. Um, but that's still pretty dense, right? All the data in the world, like if you, if you think about that, like how many Facebook data, data centers would you need? Like they're probably exabyte data centers. So like if one exabyte data center is like equivalent to four football fields, right? Like approximately. Um, and so how many, that's one exabyte and how many exabytes have we generated right now? Probably 200 exabytes or something like that. I'm just like putting out numbers out there, but I don't know really what's the number. Um, so, so, you know, like four football fields times 200, um, that's the amount of space we need to, uh, keep making. And then, you know, on top of that, keep making, keep making, keep making until we accommodate all the data we have that we've generated right now. So, um, the IO heating, that's, that's definitely, uh, you know, the, in terms of sustainability, like the energy required, you know, you have to control the environment still and hard disks, um, and our and magnetic tapes, right? Um, because they would degrade with um, you know very harsh temperature or humidity, so there's definitely um, some some energy factor in there. So you, you know yeah, if you factor all of that, then definitely it's not just the density and the carvel and you know the ability to make multiple copies, but also there's a sustainability sustainability and scalability um, argument you can make for DNA data storage. So how many years until um, you can get a like a data storage center online like what do you what do you think yeah i mean um so what i'm hoping really is like in five to ten years um you know we we i mean that that's a that's a conservative estimate of how long we'll try to figure out in here right so that it becomes really really cheap you know we need to like i don't know i think six orders of magnitude um the uh, sort of like drop in cost of DNA synthesis to make it viable uh, as, a, as a DNA data storage at, at the cost right now, um, you know, it's, it takes about, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars to store a petabyte of data. Uh, so we need to like drop that cost significantly um, so that, you know, the, the, you know, the average Joe can, can, you know, accommodate and use that um, sort of um, data storage platform. Um, so that's, that's, that's like five to 10 years. And then, you know, DNA. That's quick. That's quick. I mean, very hard engineering. Uh, you know, if the, the thing with, with, with this area, I think, is there's not, there's not a lot of funding um, for uh, DNA for like this, this space. And there's like some funding. Well, it's so new. Like, I mean, a lot of people haven't heard of it. It's such a non traditional. <laughs> and I didn't know we were going to run out of data storage. Like, <laughs> it, there's a you know there's good reason to invest some money into this technology yeah, i mean there the, definitely so there's the semiconductor research corporation which is a conglomerate of of of, of some of the semiconductor folks who are looking at the industry so they have this semi bio program where they outline some of the roadmaps of some of the technologies that they're interested in the data storage is one of them definitely um and so you know i think you know, the big players like Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. Microsoft is already like doing some, you know, research R&D on this, obviously with their 
Karen Strauss and Louis Seize in um, doing really a lot of the uh, work early. But with really funding a lot of the directions on this uh, on this area. I mean, I mean, so then it, I, the, I don't like the word moonshot. I think it's, it's become cliche now. But I think like if if, if one treats DNA as a as a moonshot, there there are a lot of verticals that that could emerge from this. Like for example, oh, yeah. like if if for example they spend some billions of dollars trying to figure out DNA right. Like it's not just DNA storage. All of a sudden, synthetic biology gets gets some gets some um, gets something out of it because you know to write really really long letters of DNA uh, for synthetic biology for therapeutics. You know, there's there's this there's this craze about gene editing now. Um, there's you know writing DNA uh, at very, for very very long DNA at very high purity and low error rates <clears throat> would be. A boon for that industry. So it's not just the Indian storage. Now there's there's this whole area that it's affecting. The random sure. access uh, point that you know, uh, if you can use the DNA as a storage device, then all of a sudden you can you can sort of take a snapshot of all the DNA of everyone in the in the world, all the species in the world right now that you can't do with current freezer technologies because it's just too mm -hmm. expensive, right? Um, um, and and to it, it's almost impossible to do with the amount of energy required to store all of that. Now all of a sudden you can do that, which we can't do anymore. We can't do right now. And on the act and the in the read side where sequencing is like, if we drop the cost of sequencing to pennies, uh, that's gonna be huge for all of this, um, um, you know, uh, personal genomics uh, sort of businesses oh, sure. that are booming right now. So that's the way I think about data storage. Like putting a lot of money in here is not just gonna be on just. You know the the semiconductor industry, but also there are other verticals where um, there's going to be a lot of um, boon for them. Yeah, there's just tremendous spinoff potential. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, <laughs> if you talk to uh, a kid who, who's presumably not part of your family, since your family seems to to get the <laughs> started really early on this, <laughs> when we talk to like you know your, your traditional kid playing with sidewalk chalk. But um, yeah. how do you, how would you explain like what you do? <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, that's uh, pretty hard. Like what, what age? Like, uh, so, you know, like a five-year-old would, would have no concept of like data yet. Like I don't think they're in TikTok yet. So it's hard to explain like, you know, but maybe, you know, like for example, if I would explain to a five-year-old, you know, like I would say I have a nephew in California who was probably like three years old. Uh, you know, he, he, he loves the movie Cars. Maybe I would, the way I would say it's like, you know, you know, that movie Cars, you know, like all your, or all that, all that YouTube videos, he has, he has an iPad, he gets glued into it. Like all those videos, um, uh, you know, you, you, you know, all that is stored somewhere like in a, in a warehouse that is as big as your house. And, you know, what I'm doing, trying to do is to make sure to minimize that house into something that can fit on your palm of your hand. So that you know, we can watch all of those movies for free. Dem democratizing, uh, you know, democratizing is probably not a <laughs> five-year-old would understand, um, but but you know, like someone older who understands a little bit about well uh, um, uh, about uh, about the concept of data. It's like I would say, you know, the fact that I have you know average height, um, black uh, black hair and, and brown eyes is because a lot of that is encoded in my DNA. That information is encoded in my DNA. Um, and so, like that's that's a lot of data, uh, and not just that, not just like my appearance, but like a lot of the things that's happening in my body is encoded in that DNA. So there's the, that tiny, tiny molecule that inside this, our our body contains a lot of information um, already. And you know, what if we can do? What if we start putting that data that we generate, like through our mobile phones, uh, into that tiny, tiny piece of DNA? And so that's. And that's what I wanted. To, that's what I want to uh, achieve is basically put all that data you generate, uh, and that's so that you never have to delete anything again. Um, you know, it's it's and it's no. I don't want to pay Apple any more premiums on just to buy a 512 gigabyte phone, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and pay uh, Apple. Uh, you know, that that just is annoying. <laughs> Yeah. So it sounds like pretty soon we'll, like, we'll almost literally have thumb drives, right? Yeah, literally, yeah. that's the literal thumb drive. <laughs> like maybe maybe fingernail drive um, is probably mm -hmm. like what we're trying to do with DNA data storage. Yeah. That's uh, that's an amazing story, James. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea of just putting the DNA for all the animals into like 
a little cube because then we can send it to Mars, you know, just in case. Yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. One of the like passion projects I have is I, I'm from Australia. Uh, and so like the fire, the Australian bushfires was an eye opener for me. Like the amount of damage it did for the Australian, um, you know, wild, uh, wildlife is just insane. Mm. And, you know, I was, I was there uh, 2019 and I was working in the storage and I was like, what if I, I think my technology can do something about storing a snapshot of, of those animals somehow and, you know, send it to moon, send it to the moon and sort of like, but I don't know who's going to pay for it. Like, should I ask Bill Gates? Should I ask Eric Smith? I'm like, uh, who's going to pay for that? But it's something that we, sh we as a... Call them up. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, Someone but... might buy it. We're going back to the moon maybe in 2024. Yeah. <laughs> You know, like the we have actually called the Frozen Zoo and the Frozen Ark. You know, the Frozen Zoo in San Diego here in the U.S. The Frozen Ark in the in London, and there's another uh, Svalbard um, uh, seed bank in. I can't remember, is it Norway? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe something like that. Something somewhere in the like where it's always cold, and, and basically we're storing a lot of our um, diversity in there, taking snapshots of that. But um, to me, I think like where this is where like some of the Again, the, the verticals that I see for DNA storage is like if you figure out a way to store like a lot of the snapshots that we have of our society right now and, and you know, maybe, you know, 20, 50 years or 100 years from now, we want to look back and see what, what we are as a society in terms of the diversity, you know, some, some record of that, um, you know, because if you try to do it now um, with current technology, you can't just put your all the sequences in the cloud, you know, we're going to run out of data <laughs> all of a sudden now. Like it becomes a chicken and egg problem. Like, oh, I have to store all the sequences because when you do sequencing, you get a lot of this very big file of data, all, all the sequences. And all of a sudden you get out of data. <laughs> so it becomes a chicken and egg problem. But if you can just st store that DNA, the molecule of that, that encodes that, that, that organism and take a snapshot of that and store a, an arc, a catalog of that, of our society uh, in 2020 or 2021, mm -hmm. um, I think that would be an important thing to do right now considering of climate change and stuff like that so i don't know i don't know who's gonna fund that but it's de definitely a passion project of mine that, you know i've been pitching to like other folks who would like to and they thought it was an interesting idea but you know where to get the money is that another question yeah. <laughs> Wait, would you volunteer to be in the database oh yeah definitely um yeah i mean i've always um there's always going to be, you know, people who are like, oh, I don't like Big Brother. You know, I don't like. <laughs> There'll be little clones of you in the future when we need more humans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not like. I don't have any issue uh, with uh, with uh, uh, with that. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I mean that's that's for sure. Uh, that's that's definitely an argument against for that. It's you know surveillance and you know. You, you, your DNA being used to, you know, um, uh, to discriminate folks. So that, 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 that there's, there's, there's definitely some ethical arguments against that. James, it's, it's, uh, it's a inspirational, uh, picture you paint of, of how we can sort of get through some of the, the sort of just moving, like lack of atoms that we have, like in terms of silicon to be able to get past that and the ways that we may be able to, may be able to preserve just as an insurance policy against, us uh, as hum humans kind of screwing things up sometimes as a way to help pr protect nature yeah. in one way or the other. Um, yeah, at least have a picture of it, you know, like a snapshot, yeah. <laughs> uh, so that you know we can go back. Oh, that's how you, how how koala used to look like, how a woolly mammoth. Like you know, it's just funny. Like we were like now looking at how what the woolly mammoth or dinosaurs would look like. You know, that's gonna be who we are probably 50 years from now or like 100 mm -hmm. years from now. Said <laughs> looking back, hey, that's who we are. We're society. Hopefully longer than that. <laughs> Like, look at 2020. I think we're going to last longer because there's, there's, you know, people like you, you know, working on stuff that's going to solve some really serious problems that aren't even on most people's radar yet. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's for we sure. Just, we just got to keep you in the lab, James. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. My PI knows that. Like, yeah, uh, definitely. Like, him, like, supporting me going back to the lab and there's COVID. Like, yeah, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, James, yeah, it's been really great. We, we, we've we've come up to, to to time. I want to be respectful of that. Yep. Um, do you have uh, any final uh, points that you'd like to to tell either us or to, or to the audience? Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, um, um, so I think, you know, I think there's um, there's a lot of challenges that, you know, there uh, for, I mean, DNA data storage is set up for a cool story if you go back to how it started from its humble beginnings um, to now. Um, and, and just like, I look out for like the next, uh, the next generation of the digital DNA, uh, um, digital data storage. Uh, but it's, it's gonna take a long time. And I think some people are skeptic about it. And just, I just wanna like tell like people that, you know, it, some, some technologies that takes time, you know, integrating circuit, integrated circuits, then we didn't have our computers right now. So it took a long time. So, you know, I think people who are really excited in the field like, like, when are we going to get that? It's going to get 20 years from now. I think it needs to be a little bit more patient. You know, technology just takes a long time. And I think everyone, everyone's trying to get that, uh, this technology as, as quickly as possible. Um, and so, and, and that's it. Yeah, if you're interested in, in, in learning about DNA data storage, yeah, I'm, I'm always happy to, uh, you know, schedule a call and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, thanks for watching this episode of Tough Tech Today. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a five-star review, like, and subscribe. In two weeks, we'll be sitting down with Louis Perna of Axion Systems. He's the co-founder of a company that's using electrospray thrusters to revolutionize the small satellite industry. Thanks for joining, and we'll catch you on the next show.